Good morning and welcome. I wish I could see you, but I still want to I'm still delighted that uh, though I can't see you, you're obviously watching this and uh, are entering, preparing to enter into worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ along with me. Um, as we begin, I just want to make a few announcements. Um, the first is just an, a reminder, as I always do, that we have two opportunities for prayer uh, today at 11.45 a.m. this Sunday. Uh, there's the Zoom prayers of the community where you can join with a group of people who will bring forward requests and thanksgivings and offer them up in prayer. And then there's also the virtual prayer room, we call it, uh, which is a more a private um, opportunity where you uh, can join and be receive personal prayer um, from an in individual. And you can um, connect with them anytime between 12.30 and 12.45 p.m. Uh, through Zoom. Links for both of those opportunities are in the Sunday email um, that comes out to you each week. Also, um, Young Life, um, uh, one of our, the partner ministries we work alongside with, is having their annual fundraiser, but this year it'll be a virtual fundraiser because they can't have a dessert evening like they usually do. And you can um, participate in that online thing. I think it's about 20 minutes, um, any time between March 28th and March 31st. Uh, there is a link in the Sunday email that will lead to the page that when it's all ready, we'll have the link to go to it. Um, so you can kind of click there, read a bit more about it if you want to, and put it in your favorites thing. And then when the time comes, just go there and click the link and participate. Great opportunity, even if you don't give anything it's a really great opportunity just to learn what young life is doing in our town also um we are going to worship on good friday uh but it's going to be a citywide service so it's going to be look a lot different than this it's going to be created by a bunch of different churches in uh together and um that will be um available at 10 a.m uh on good friday and next week you will get um the link to the website where that will magically appear when 10 a.m. comes. <laughs> so I'll have more instructions about that next week. Um, and for now, that's it for announcements for today. So I would like to now move to uh, the call to worship uh, for this morning, which comes from Psalm 51, which is a psalm of David. It says, when the prophet Nathan came to him, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, which as you'll see is the scripture reading that'll come later, I read to us by Mike. So let us listen to these words of David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. 
Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we come this morning asking that you would soften our hearts as you softened the heart of King David. Father, that we would not in our stubbornness try and hide from you, but that we would openly confess and put all our hope and trust on the mercy that you offer to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, it is our prayer that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would do that work in us this morning. We ask this in his name. Amen. Right, we're going to sing a hymn called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And I invite you to please stand with me, if you would, as we sing this together. you please bow with me as we offer up our prayer to confession of confession at this time let's pray merciful god we confess to you now that we have sinned we confess the sins that no one knows and the sins that everyone knows the sins that are a burden to us and the sins that do not bother us we confess our sins as a church that we have not loved one another as Christ has loved us, and that we have not given ourselves in love and service for the world as Christ gave himself for us. Father, forgive us. Send your Holy Spirit to us to give us power to live as by your mercy you have called us to live. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, as you have come to God in repentance, may you experience the fulfillment of God's promises in these moments and in the days to come. For as the Paul, Apostle Paul declared, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. 
Therefore, may you be assured of your forgiveness on account of your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I invite you to pause this video, and if you look in the description area underneath, you'll see links to some songs to worship along with. If you have kids with you, there's a separate link for a kid's song, and when you're finished, uh, we'll continue. Welcome back. Um, at this time, we're going to offer up the prayers of our community, so I will open a prayer and offer some thanksgivings to God and some requests. Then I'll give you an invitation to do the same, at which point I ask you to pause your video, offer up your own thanksgivings and requests to the Lord, and when you unpause, I'll close the prayer. Would you please now bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning aware that we are in desperate need of forgiveness. And so, Father, we ask that you would soften our hearts for, Father, we recognize that our instincts are to try and hide our sin, but that you have called us that we must step out into the light, and that as we step into the light, you will show us your mercy and your grace and forgive us for our sins. And so, Father, we especially thank give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that through him you have made this all possible that we have a way back into fellowship with you even after we have committed sin, even after we've committed the most dark of sins, even as David did, adultery and murder. Father, there is no depth that is too deep from which you can, cannot call people back. And so, Father, we ask that you would have mercy on us and that you would call us out and that you would lead us to confess and back into fellowship with you through forgiveness. Lord, we also want to ask that this message of grace would find its way, not just into the ears of people, but into their hearts. And so, Lord, we pray um, for the citywide Good Friday service, Father, that is being advertised online. Father, we pray that some of this advertising would attract people who have never explored the meaning of your son Jesus' death before, and that they would be able to enter into hearing the good news of your son Jesus Christ, death and forgiveness of their sins for the first time by following these ads and participating in this service. Lord, we also ask that you would be able to help us as we, we still long for in-person worship. And Father, we pray that in your mercy, you would open up doors for that to happen in some way or somehow. Father, we thank you for the way that um, different vaccines and things are being provided and for this um, hope for a future that is different than the present. Um, but Father, we just confess before you that we long to worship you together. And so we ask in your mercy that you would make that happen somehow. Father, we also want to be, uh, pray that we may be given humility to repent when you do convict us of sin, Father, we know that it's, it's a difficult thing, but we know it's a good gift. And so we ask you to give us that gift, the gift of conviction of sin. And at this time, we also want to ask for our own personal requests and to give you thanks out of our own personal circumstances at this time. Gracious God, we thank you for your mercy on us, that you truly do have compassion on us, and that all that you do, no matter how harsh it may seem in our eyes, is for the purpose of redeeming us and bringing us to life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to submit to you, that despite our own struggles, that we would surrender to your Son, Jesus Christ, and submit to him in faith, both this day and forevermore. We ask this in his name. Amen.
At this time, I invite you to um, set up whatever you're going to do with your kids. Uh, if you want that, you may have a package that you received um, with materials and a little lesson. Um, if you've lost the little sh sheet that has the lesson on it, uh, you can find it again by looking in the Sunday email. There's a link to it in there. Um, and uh, now I'd like to invite Mike to come and read scripture for us. Good morning. <clears throat> the reading this morning is from 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 25. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children, and it shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you, anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and all of this had been too little. I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household I am going to bring a calamity on you before your very eyes. Will take, your, will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for, child, for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood be beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food from them or with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us, and when we spoke to him, how could we now tell him the child is dead? he may do something desperate. David noticed that the attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. 
Then he went to his own house, and he, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked them, Why are you asking, acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, answered, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, and I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, the Lord, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to be named Nathan the prophet, to name him Jedidiah. Jedidiah means loved by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be His name. Amen. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Gracious God, we ask that at this time you would would open our minds to understand what it is that you would have us learn from this story and that you'd also soften our hearts to respond in obedience and faith to whatever it is you open. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Christ, and for the further fame and glory of his name. Amen. Our instinct, as fallen human beings, that is, is to try and cover up our sin, isn't it? We begin life as children who, after bopping their sibling on the head with the plastic hammer, try immediately to convince that same sibling that they're okay and they don't really need to tell mommy, right? Our instinct is to try and cover up sin. And although we're pretty bad at doing it as youngsters, we get much better at it as we get older, don't we? Sometimes, perhaps even oftentimes, we succeed in covering up our sin and carrying on with our lives as if no wrongdoing ever took place. But of course, there remains a large lurking question that hangs over our heads. What is God going to do about it? What is the Lord Almighty, who is perfect in holiness and who sees everything, What is he going to do about all the sins that we have successfully hidden from others and have gone on living our lives as if we had never committed any wrong? What's the Lord going to do? It's the question we were left with at the end of chapter 11 last week. After hearing how David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then succeeded in murdering Uriah and then covered it all up, we were left with these ominous words at the end of the chapter. But the thing David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord knows, my brothers and sisters. The Lord knows. He knows about David's hidden sins. And he knows about our hidden sins too. So what is the Lord going to do about it? Well, the first thing that the Lord does is he sends us his messenger. You may have noticed in the story of David and Bathsheba from chapter 11 that David succeeds in both committing his sin and covering it all up through the sending of messengers. Well, now the Lord, the true king of Israel and of all heaven and earth, is going to send his own messenger. 2 Samuel chapter 12 begins with the words, The Lord sent Nathan to David. David did not seek the Lord, yet God still sent his prophet Nathan as a messenger to accomplish what God desired in his life. And God still does this for us today. 
Sometimes he sends a, sends a prophetic word to a brother or sister in Christ, which is then delivered to us through them. But more often, I think, God re- relies on the prophetic words that he has already given to us in the Bible. There is a reason why the words of Nathan are recorded in Scripture, and the reason is this, that these words are just as much a message for you and me and our sin cover-ups as they were for David and his sin cover-up. If this message was only for David, God would not have inspired the Old Testament author to write it down. So if you're wondering what God is going to do in response to the sin that you and I have covered up, well, this is the first thing he will do. He will send us a message through a prophet or through the 66 books of prophecy that we find in the Bible. In fact, the words of the prophet Nathan in this passage may be specifically meant for you today. This may be a direct message from God to you. And this message has a purpose, my brothers and sisters. This message is sent to us by God to create a powerful opportunity to repent through confessing our sin. The purpose of this message is to create an occasion for confession. And this is exactly what it achieves in the life of David. Immediately after Nathan delivers his message to David, David, who has successfully covered up his sin, remember, then gives this reply in verse 13. These are the words out of his mouth right away. Verse 13, we read that, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. Now the power of this confession is easy to miss because it's so short. But that, in fact, is what makes it powerful. (laughs) And this is easier to see when we compare David's response here to Nathan, the prophet of God, the messenger, with King Saul, the king before David, his response to God's messenger, Samuel. You might know, if you're familiar with this book, the books of Samuel, that in 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Saul sinned against the Lord by directly disobeying a command of the Lord. Yet when confronted by the messenger, the prophet Samuel, Saul's first response to Samuel was to make an excuse. In verse 15 of that chapter, he blames his soldiers, saying, they made me do it. And then Samuel says, nope. And Saul then goes on to say, well, no, no. In verse 20, he says, well, I did obey the Lord. He denies his sin. And then finally, after receiving a new news through Samuel that the Lord was going to remove him as king, Saul finally says, oh, I have sinned. But then immediately goes on to say, but I sinned because they made me do it. <laughs> Samuel's message to Saul resulted in a conversation that took 15 verses to narrate, almost the whole chapter, and ended without anything sincere, just concern about himself and how he looked in the eyes of other people. David's response, in contrast, takes one sentence. One. As David Bergen comments, David's confession came with immediacy, came right away, without denial, and without excuse. David's confession is profound because it came so quickly and was so short. In fact, Joyce Baldwin argues that this was the turning point in the life of David and the clearest indication that he was different from Saul in the most essential relationship of all, that of submission to the Lord. For God did not send Nathan to David to hear David's excuses or denials and to consider those things. Nor did God send Nathan to David to give David time to think things over and reconsider his former actions. God sent his messenger Nathan to David for the purpose of creating an occasion for David to freely confess his sin and to confess it right then. And God succeeds. God gets David, a man who had killed to cover up his sin, to confess out loud in his throne room, I have sinned against the Lord. And perhaps you are now thinking of some wrong that you have done, something that remains hidden, covered up. And you're thinking to yourself, man, there is no way that I would ever confess that out loud to anyone. There's no way. Well, I don't intend to sound cheeky, 
but I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I'm convinced that King David was at least as motivated, but much more likely more motivated to continue covering up his sin than you are or than I am. If you have murdered multiple people to cover up your sin, you might be tied with David in motivation to try and cover things up. But the truth is that in order to confess your sin at all, we need something. And what we need is to receive the same gift from God that David himself received, the gift of conviction. Like David, we need God's word to convince us of our own sin, to convince us that it cannot be ignored and convince us that it must be dealt with. We need the gift of conviction. And I would say that most of us don't see being accused of a wrongdoing as a good thing, right? As a gift. I think most of us feel like Eve likely felt when God came and asked Adam why he had eaten the forbidden fruit and Adam immediately pointed at Eve and said, the woman you put here, she gave it to me. Yikes, right? I mean, no wonder men and women still have difficulty getting along. But what Adam did in that moment was condemnation, not conviction. And this, I believe, is what distinguishes messages from the Lord from messages from the evil one. For Satan is the one who condemns. He is the one who sends accusations that intend to stick us with the crime. He's the one who wants to see David and us die for our sin. But the Lord convicts. He sends accusations that spur us to come out of the darkness and stand in the light of the truth so that we may live. He wants to see David and us live, even though we've sinned. And so the Lord seeks to convince us of our own sin, as he does with David through Nathan here. So God inspires Nathan to start, not with the accusation, but rather with an appeal to David's own sense of justice. In verses 1 through 4 of 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan tells the story of a poor man's only lamb, an ewe or female lamb, that's what that means, being taken and slaughtered by a rich man who had many sheep. Nathan then waits for David's own conscience to bring him to a just verdict in the case. Notice a just verdict. I think if David had gone to an unjust verdict, it wouldn't have been good enough to bring out the accusation yet, but David gets there. In this story, it creates the situation where David comes to the verdict in verse 5, expressing deep anger at the cruelty of this man and arriving at the verdict prescribed in the law of Moses. In the Torah, the law of Moses, if you borrowed a sheep and you lost it, you had to give one sheep in order to make up for the one that you lost. If you stole a sheep and it was found in your possession, you must give back two sheep. One, the original one that you stole, plus another one, so that you would experience the loss that you intended to bring on someone else. But if you stole a sheep and you slaughtered it, that was considered so despicable and callous that you are required to give four sheep in return. So only after David's proper sense of justice had been aroused and he reaches this just verdict, a verdict that God himself put forward in his law, only when David gets to that point does Nathan then say to David, you are the man. You're the man. Having first stirred up David's own conscience to a just and right conclusion, David could now no longer escape his own conscience. He was convinced, convicted. And the Lord wants to give this experience of conviction to you and to me as a gift. God wants to speak through the scriptures and through our spirit-filled brothers and sisters in Christ to bring us to the point where we have no escape from our own conscience's just conclusions. He wants to bring us to the point where we realize that all of the righteous anger that we feel towards all of the sin and wickedness we see out there in the world is all rightly and justly applied straight back onto us. For God is not out to convince other people that we're sinners. That's the work of the devil. God is out to convince our own consciences that we're sinners. That's conviction. 
And more than that, God also wants to convince us that our sin is primarily an offense against him personally and only secondarily an offense against other people. We know this because in verses 7 through 9, Nathan does more than surprise David with the secret knowledge that could have only come from God. The secret knowledge of David's adultery and Uriah's murder by the Ammonites, things that had been totally covered up. Through Nathan, God puts these secret sins, not only exposes them publicly, but puts them in a wider context, in the context of the fact that God had been extremely generous with David, that he had saved him from Saul, that he had made him king, and that he had given him many wives. God even says that if it had been necessary, he would have given David even more. And yet before David had even sent the messenger to get Bathsheba and commit adultery in the first place, he points out that David had already made the decision to despise the word of the Lord. To act. Just He made the decision to act against the command, you shall not commit adultery before he ever got to the place where that happened. David's decision to despise the Lord's word happened first before any harm ever came to Bathsheba or to Uriah. And in despising the Lord's word, the Lord tells David in verse 10, you despised me. Let that sink in for a moment. In despising the word's Lord and choosing to do our own things, God takes it personally. You despised me. As long as David had respected the word of the Lord, the people around him were safe. But once David despised the Lord's word, treated even one of the Lord's commandments as if it was not important, then and only then were his neighbors Bathsheba and Uriah in danger of being treated as a sexual object and as being expendable. This is why David's confession is not like Saul's. It is not just, I have sinned, but is rather, I have sinned against the Lord. God takes every sin we commit against another person as a personal attack on himself first. God sees every sin we commit against another as completely avoidable if we had only listened to his word given to us through the Bible. And because God sees our sin as first and foremost a personal offense against him, he himself responds personally with the consequences. I think we often like to talk about natural consequences to our sins. The idea that the world is designed in such a way that if we sin, the world naturally brings consequences of our sin back onto our own heads. But the Bible never talks about sin or its consequences in that way. In the Bible, consequences for sin happen for one reason and one reason only. Because God himself makes them happen. And so before David even has the chance to confess, the Lord declares to him in verse 10 that because David killed Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites, in verse 10 we read, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house. And then in verse 11, the Lord says that because David took Bathsheba to be his wife, now we read halfway through verse 11, before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you and he will sleep with them, with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And then even after David makes his confession of sin, the Lord declares that this set of consequences will not be taken away. In verse 14, after David's confession, the Lord says, But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. The promise of the sword coming against your house. It's happening anyway, David. In fact, if you were to read the David stories all the way to the end, you would learn that David loses four sons. Not only this nameless child, but also his three oldest children, Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah. Like the verdict out of David's own mouth in this parable that was spoken by God through Nathan, the parable of the man who had to pay four lambs for the slaughter of the one, so David loses four sons for the slaughter of Uriah. 
And one of those sons, Absalom, will be the one to take ten of David's wives and sleep with them in a tent on the rooftop of David's own house in the sight of everybody. Amazingly, these consequences all happen in a chain reaction of free choices that link all the way back to David's choice to sleep with Bathsheba. But the Lord here, through the prophet Nathan, is letting David know that these consequences are God's doing. They are not natural. They come from him. And this then is confirmed when even after David's pleading and fasting for the son uh, born to him through Bathsheba to live, God still chooses to let that child die. You see, my brothers and sisters, our sin has earthly consequences that God is not willing to undo. God does not bring back the innocent victim Uriah to life right away. God does not stop Amnon from imitating his father David and raping the girl he lusts after, his half-sister Tamar. And God does not stop Absalom, Tamar's little brother, from murdering Amnon for committing the rape. And God does not stop Joab from killing Absalom for trying to kill his father David and take over the throne. And God does not stop Solomon from killing both Joab and David's son Adonijah when they attempt to usurp the throne from Solomon. Sin has earthly consequences. Consequences that may look natural, like the natural results of sins committed beforehand, but which the Bible assures us are actually from the hand of God. For we have to remember that Scripture tells us plainly that the wages of sin is death, and that death is not natural. Death is a curse brought on us by God in response to our sin as Genesis 3 makes so painstakingly clear, which is what makes what happens immediately after David's confession so incredibly surprising. It should be incredibly surprising to us, folks, because this very same God who leaves in place certain consequences for David's sin that were declared in advance of his confession does not bring about the additional consequences that David also deserved. For the consequence of stealing a sheep and slaughtering it was to lose four of your own sheep. But the consequence in the law of Moses for committing adultery or for committing murder was death. And yet, after David confesses his sin in verse 13, we read that Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin You are not going to die. In addition to all the other earthly consequences that the Lord insists on keeping, David himself deserved to die. And yet the Lord gives David life instead of death. The Lord, Nathan declares, has taken away your sin. And it is this unexpected mercy that exposes why God's work of conviction truly is a priceless gift. For the reason God sends his messengers to convict us of our sin in a way that leads us to confess, I have sinned against the Lord, is not so that God can condemn us and put us to death, but rather so that God can forgive us and give life to people who deserve to die. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is the same for us today. It is by God's forgiveness and his forgiveness alone that we receive abundant and eternal life in the place of death. Conviction is a gift because it's what makes the difference between Saul and David, between the denial and excusing of our sin and the free and simple confession, I've sinned before the Lord. And the good news is that God forgives repentant sinners. To those who deserve death, even those who have sunk to the depth of evil like David did, God gives the gift of life to all who confess. For God requires nothing of David beyond his confession. Nothing. He asks for no sacrifice or gift or special deed. On the basis of confession of sin against the Lord, confession that displays David's return to faith in him, on that confession alone... God forgives, always. And it is precisely in this act of forgiveness that the story of David once again points ahead to the true Christ of God, Jesus of Nazareth. We've learned through God's work in David's life 
that the goal of the Christ is to establish the dwelling place of God on earth in the midst of God's people through a future descendant of David. What we haven't been told is how, how this future descendant, the true Christ or Messiah, will make this happen. You see, none of the earthly consequences that David suffers for his sin have any power to make things right. David's loss of four sons does nothing to help murder Uriah. Absalom's adultery with David's wives does absolutely nothing to help violated Bathsheba. These consequences merely demonstrate how truly terrible sin is, all of it, in God's eyes, and that God is not going to excuse any sin ever. God will never look at a sin and say, that's okay. God never excuses sin. He only forgives it. But how? That's the question. How can a just God forgive sin? How can God let someone like David, who deserves to die, live? Well, the answer is hinted at, hinted at already in the answer that the Lord gives to David through Nathan. The answer we read in verse 13, which says, The Lord has taken away your sin. Who's taken away the sin? Did the earthly consequences that David's family suffered take away his sin? Absolutely not. Then who has taken away David's sin? The Lord has taken away David's sin. And therefore it is the Lord who has bound himself to pay the price for that sin, to pay the penalty of death. None other than the Lord himself pledges to suffer death. In his reply to David, the Lord pledges to pay this penalty, the penalty that we deserve. The explanation of how God will do this will require God to inspire later prophets like Isaiah to talk about the suffering servant who would atone for his sins by our sins by his death. And it wouldn't be until God had sent Jesus and inspired the New Testament authors that it was finally revealed to us that this suffering servant and the Christ were one and the same person, Jesus. But it is this Jesus, and that is who Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ precisely because he is the one who made forgiveness possible through his atoning, atoning death on the cross. Apart from the forgiveness of sin, apart from being, our sins being taken away, as it's talking about here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, God can't dwell amongst his people. Apart from forgiveness of sin, the Christ can't fulfill his mission to make a dwelling place of God for God on earth. Therefore, although it was at his conception that Jesus was first declared to be the Christ, it is with his death and resurrection that we see it accomplished. Everything we have learned about Jesus the Christ in this series on David changed from being future prophecy to being reality. The day that Jesus died on the cross, the day God paid the price to forgive us. For we know that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the unique bearer of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit raised him to eternal life only three days after his death. We know all these things we've learned about the Christ, that it's Jesus who is this Christ, the one who sees everything clearly, who comes with the gifts of God, who is the one who gives us the weapons of his spirit and his love to conquer evil, the one who is faithful to his covenant love with us even when we're unfaithful to him, the one who leaves vengeance in the hands of God, the one who accepts loss and grieves it in order to lead us into the promised land, the one who is our shepherd, the one who takes up the mission of God on our behalf, the one who makes us into a living temple, the dwelling place of God, and who even keeps our side of that agreement. All of these things that we have learned about who the Christ is through the stories of David is what the New Testament has in mind when it calls Jesus the Christ on the day that he was born. And all of that is true. It's real because Jesus our Christ did the one thing necessary. He fulfilled the pledge God made to David when God forgave David a thousand years beforehand. On God's behalf, Jesus paid the penalty of death that we deserved so that God could remain just and still forgive. So that God could take away our sin and do what he's always longed to do, dwell in us and among us 
through the work of his Christ. And this is no mistake. It was what God intended all along. For he himself pledged to pay the price for our sin on the day that he forgave David. And that is why we should feel no fear when the Spirit of God convicts us for our sin. For we know that the one who convicts us died for us. And his conviction then is for our good. It leads us to confess our sin, to step out into the light and thereby into the forgiveness that brings life everlasting. Yes, there are still earthly consequences for sin, but the good news is that we will not die. We will live. For Jesus our Christ has paid the price for our sin in his death on the cross, and every person who turns to Jesus in faith by confessing their sin against the Lord will find that the Lord is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when the message of God sent to you through hearing the script words of Scripture or through the words of a brother or a sister in Christ has the effect of convincing you that you have sinned, receive that conviction of sin as a gift from God. For that is what it is. Conviction is the way God rescues sinners who succeed in covering up their sin. Through conviction, God brought David, a man who had murdered to cover up sin, to confession and from confession to eternal life. And God desires the very same thing for you and for me. So when conviction comes, may we not be like Saul who denied his sin and made excuses for his sin and remained concerned only for how he looked in the eyes of other people. Rather, when conviction comes from the Lord, let us respond like David did and simply say, I have sinned against the Lord. And then let us trust that David's infinitely greater son, Jesus, has done the work of the Christ. He has paid for our sin. And all of the blessings of God now flow to us through him. So my brothers and sisters, let the gift of conviction lead us to confession and into the peace of God's forgiveness that is found on the other side. Amen. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story the story of your great salvation, how you are so amazing that you can take people who murder to cover up their sin and bring them to everlasting life in a way that is just and true. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would do that same work in our lives, that when your Spirit convicts us as we listen to the message of your word, the message of a sister or brother in Christ whom you have sent to speak to us. And we feel our consciences convinced that we have done what is wrong in your eyes. Father, help us to confess that we have sinned against you so that we might move into the light and the freedom that comes in your forgiveness the forgiveness that was won for us by Jesus our Christ when he died on the cross. In this way, Father, may we delight in the joy and the good news that started with Christmas, that it, but achieves its reality in the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. May we go from this place confident that we live in this new reality on account of what you have done through your son. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a song, a hymn that closes, that reminds us of the confidence that we have in seeking shelter through confession of sin in our God. It's called Rock of Ages. And I invite you to stand with me as we sing it. I'm
As we close, I just want to give an invitation to you. If in hearing the word of the Lord this morning, you have felt the conviction that you have done what is wrong in the eyes of the Lord, I invite you to confess that. I invite you to go to a crushed Christian brother or sister and to confess before them that you have sinned against the Lord and to receive from them the words of forgiveness that are yours through Jesus Christ. If you don't have anyone with you to do that with you, I invite you to um, connect with our virtual prayer room, and I know that the person who's there will be happy to do that for you and to keep in confidence what you share. But now may you go in the confidence that God convicts us so that we confess and find life through forgiveness, the forgiveness won for us by Jesus on the cross. In that knowledge, may you prepare yourself for next week when we enter into the week of remembering Jesus' journey to the cross and then his resurrection from the grave. May you go now in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.